Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hello. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for raising your health IQ with us in more than 130 countries around the world, making the exam room one of the most downloaded podcasts anywhere today. So thank you so very much for making the world a healthier place with us. We are starting today with a look at blood pressure and the foods that can help to lower it naturally. Well, which foods are they? We're going to find out in just a moment when we, when we are joined by Dr. Neil Barnard. He is here. But before we get to that, there are a couple of points that I want to make about hypertension. And number one is that it affects nearly a uh, nearly half of all adults in the U in the U.S. I mean, because of that, because it is so prevalent and so common, is it kind of going overlooked? Is it is it not getting the treatment that it deserves? because it's kind of the norm? Well, consider this. High blood pressure was a factor in at least a half a million deaths in 2019. And the price tag that comes with it is something that would give anybody sticker shock, costing the US $131 billion. $131 billion every year, according to the CDC. So we will be talking about high blood pressure, getting some help for that momentarily, but it is Wednesday. It is the live show. And that also means we're opening up the doctor's mailbag to answer your questions. So whatever is on your mind related to health and nutrition, we would love to help get you an answer. Go ahead and drop your question in the comment or in the chat. You can also send it to me on Twitter or Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll, WLC. I promise you we will get to as many many as we possibly can on the show today. But let's go ahead and kick things off right now by welcoming Dr. Neil Barnard back to the exam room live. My friend, so good to see you again. Good to see you, Chuck. High blood pressure. When I was looking it up for today's show, I was stunned to hear that nearly half of all adults in the U.S. have it. What is the current criteria, the clinical criteria for high blood pressure? Yeah. But by the way, uh, back to where you were starting about why this is such a terrible thing, so, why it's so uh, so expensive. It's not really that people have to go and buy blood pressure pills. That, that's a big part of it. They are pricey. And often you're on two pills or three. Um, but the, the thing about it is it affects your heart and it affects your kidney. It affects other parts of your health. So all the health costs that you need to treat, all those things, those are all adding up into that astronomical figure. It's not just the blood pressure itself. But uh, um, the criteria that we want to aim for is 120 over 80. That's uh, a good one. And it's been around for a long time. And there have been mild adjustments here and there to it, but that's still a good number. And what that number means is that the doctor, nurse, medical technician, or yourself, you put the cuff around your arm and the blood pressure will go up to 120 and down to 80 with each heartbeat. When your heart is contracting, it goes up to 120. When it's relaxing, it goes down to 80. That's systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic, 120 down to 80. Um, if you are higher than that with either one of those measurements, we're gonna say that's higher, and we, higher than it should be, and we wanna bring it down. Um, a lot of people will say, well, gee, you know, I changed my diet. I'm way below that. I'm now you know, 100 over, over uh, 65 or something like that. Is that dangerous? Um, the answer is if you're a healthy person, no, blood, lower blood pressure is a good thing to be, is, is a good place to be. All right. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can't bring that blood pressure down. Our first question comes to us from Tessie, who is wondering what are the best foods to lower high blood pressure? Ah, great question. Uh, so what can we do about it? There, there are really a couple of different strategies that we're aiming for when we're picking foods. Um, the first one you already know about. We want to get away from high sodium foods and get toward high potassium foods. Sodium brings blood pressure up, potassium brings it down. We also want to get away from high fat foods and go toward low fat foods. Fat brings blood pressure up too because it makes the blood thicker, more viscous, harder to move, and that raises blood pressure. And the final thing, the third thing, is foods that help you lose weight. So low fat, vegan, high fiber foods, those all help. So what specifically are we thinking about? All right, I wanna have a food that doesn't have a lot of fat, doesn't have a lot of so uh, sodium, has a lot of potassium. Vegetables, fruits, whole range, they're gonna be your very best friends. Uh, along with them, 
are the bean group and the whole grain group. What are the worst? Okay, the, the three worst foods are cheese, cheese, and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is that the cheese, it's really high in saturated fat. It's got sodium too. Yeah, hold on to your blood pressure here. Um, if I have potato chips, two ounces of potato chips, 330 milligrams of sodium in that pack. If I have some cheddar, it's got more sodium. Yes, it has more sodium than potato chips. Uh, 350, if it's Velveeta, it's 800 milligrams of sodium in two ounces. So get away from the cheese, get away from the meats in general. So vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, get away from the animal products. Uh, oh, by the way, one other thing. Coconut oil, palm oil have been marketed a lot. Throw them out. Shine your shoes with them. Don't eat them. <laughs> you know, you mentioned potato chips uh, just a minute ago. I'm glad that you did because we have a question from Sabrina. Potato chips, absolutely a vegan food. And if you spend any time in the grocery store recently, you've noticed that there are more and more vegan options on store shelves. But Sabrina is wondering, can those processed vegan foods, like the ones you find in the frozen food aisle, also raise blood pressure? They can if you did one of the things that we were talking about, added a whole bunch of sodium or added a lot of bad fats. Those are the two ways to ruin it. Now, processing itself gets a bad name, but it's not such a terrible thing. If you take a grain of wheat, grind it up into flour and you make spaghetti out of it, that's fine. Um, as long as you're not putting something bad, uh, bad on top of your spaghetti, that's a perfectly fine food, even though it's processed. Where we run into trouble is when people start adding uh, a lot of sodium, and a lot of fatty foods, especially the coconut and palm oil, that's when you really run into trouble. Let's take a question from Andre. This is a really good one. And I think it's something that a lot of people do immediately when they're told that they have blood pre high blood pressure. It's the first thing that they do. Andre is wondering, is cutting out table salt enough to lower blood pressure? Um, it's a good idea uh, as a general rule. But, but the amount that you, if you added up the salt that ends up in you. The amount that came from your salt shaker is almost insignificant. The, the big driver is the salt that was in the food first. So this is where cheese is a real baddie, um, as for the reasons that I mentioned. It's, it's integral to the production of cheese products. But then it's the cheese that was added at the factory as it was being, as the product was being processed. Uh, for example, green beans very low in sodium when they're grown. And that's true of almost all plant foods, very low sodium. But when they put them in the can, the manufacturers realize you'll buy it and you'll like it more if I throw in a whole bunch of salt. It's not in the green beans naturally. They, they just added it. So that's really the issue. And that's more important than the sodium you add at the table. So what does this mean? Um, a lot of restaurants that are trying to have healthier foods or people who are doing this at home have come to the conclusion that when you're at the recipe stage, keep the sodium really low and then allow a person to have a salt shaker so they can put a little bit of salt on, right, like on the surface of the food. And so they're adding a bit, their tastes think it's okay, but the amount that was actually kind of baked in, so to speak, is really quite small. All right, let's pivot right now. We're going to come back to blood pressure in just a moment, but let's pivot and take an important question from Oliver. This is top of mind with a lot of people right now. Oliver wrote in, wondering, will a healthy diet help reduce the dangers of the Omicron variant? Ah, uh, hugely important thing, obviously. Um, quick caveat, we're all learning from this virus. Um, we already know that it, it's, it's transmissible, it's moving, frankly, from day to day, we are watching the, the movement of this virus. And to say a couple of obvious things, it's here, it's showing, as we've always been talking about since the beginning of the pandemic, that viruses are working to find new hosts. Omicron, like every other coronavirus, cannot exist outside of an animal's body. So that's why when it's sneezed out from somebody, it's going to somebody else and it's got to get there to survive. And when it goes to a new person, it's got a new immune system to try to negotiate with. And that's where the, the virus mutates. Um, so as viruses transmit from one person to another, they change. So Omicron is really different. Uh, Delta was different from the uh, coronaviruses we were dealing with at the beginning of, of 2020, 2021. Delta was different, but not hugely different, meaning the spike 
proteins on the surface of the virus, which is the target of the vaccine, uh, or the vaccine primes your immune system to target that. That wasn't really hugely different. So the Delta variant um, can be reduced by the vaccine, just like the uh, uh, just, just like the, the variants that preceded it. So what about Omicron? With Omicron, it looks, who knows, uh, we're going to know a lot more in about six weeks than we know now, um, but it looks like there is some potential for changing those proteins. If that's the case, that could cause the vaccines to work less effectively. And we've learned that foods do indeed make a difference for uh, the coronaviruses up into Omicron. So now the question, and I think this is what you're getting at, Oliver, uh, could food still work against, um, against the Omicron? And the, the tentative answer is, I think they will. Here's what we know. Uh, there was a big study called the COVID symptom study. You've probably heard me talk about this. As soon as the pandemic began, uh, more than 500,000 people voluntarily tracked their symptoms. And of these, about 30,000 developed COVID. And so then people looked at foods that helped them, foods that, that, that made uh, infections worse. And that's where some of the data came in showing if you were on a more or less plant-based diet, your risk of severe COVID was cut by a good 40%. So, okay, great. Chalk went up for the plant-based diet. And then there was another uh, similar study looking at six different countries showing same thing. Plant-based diets really reduce the risk, especially of severe COVID. Um, so, and forgive me for this long answer, Chuck. Um, somebody comes in, they got Omicron, they change, they're, uh, they've been on a plant-based diet, are they gonna be less likely to have severe illness? Your, I, I don't believe that changes in the spike proteins are gonna have any I don't think that's going to be a problem with regard to the efficacy of the diet, because what's the diet do? The diet facilitates your immune strength. You're creating antibodies to a virus, whether you've been vaccinated or, or not. Um, if, if you've been vaccinated, you're primed. If, you've, um, if, if, if you haven't yet been exposed to it, then you can't produce antibodies until you get the initial exposure. You also have white blood cells that are there to engulf invaders. It looks like people on plant-based diets have stronger antibody responses and stronger uh, white blood cell responses, and that will probably hold true regardless of the variant. That does not mean that you are bulletproof if you are vegan, <laughs> nor does it mean that you should not get vaccinated or anything like that. It doesn't mean anything like that. What it means is that when the virus comes calling, if you've been on a healthy plant-based diet, particularly if it has helped you to keep a low body weight, low cholesterol and low blood pressure. You have a strong measure of added protection against viruses based on the best data we have. That includes the variants up until now and will very likely include Omicron. Yeah, and let's not forget the uh, study that was recently conducted by our colleague, Dr. Hanna Kaliova. I believe you were involved in this as well uh, at Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C., yeah. that tracked uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet among hospital workers throughout the pandemic. Um, and that showed some very positive results in terms of their health, despite the fact that there is this pandemic that was raging around them at times. It, it's good that you mentioned that, Chuck, because one of the things that we see is during the pandemic, everybody was under stress. And the question was, is stress going to affect your immune system? And you'd, you'd have to think it would. Um, and if there's anybody under maximal stress during the pandemic, it's the hospital workers. And yes, Dr. Kaliova, her team, and I was pleased to be part of this, um, brought to Sibley Memorial Hospital here in D.C. to the hospital workers themselves, a healthy plant-based diet and just, just once a week support in following it. And exactly what you would hope happened, happened, which is people lost weight. Their cholesterols came down, but physically they were healthier. But then we looked at just quality of life. How could you have any quality of life during a pandemic when you're a hospital worker? The answer is their quality of life improved and they were able to give better care to their patients. And Dr. Kaliova will be joining us here on the program in the very near future. Uh, she and I are going to be getting in depth about the study, which was just absolutely fascinating. Um, I can't wait to share those particular results with everybody. I think that it's going to be great. Um, and I also want to take a second, Dr. Barnard, to say hi to everybody who's joining us today. The exam room is in the chat room. They're active as always. Mommy Vegan Numi. That's a, that's a fun name. Uh, Salad. <laughs> 
Strong Soprano, I'm assuming that you are a singer. Mike Jones is here. Tofu Tuesday, as always, joining us on a Wednesday. Riri eats what? I don't know what Riri eats, but I am glad that they are here. Uh, and our friend Richard Hubbard, also in the chat room at 12.08 today. Richard has a question wondering, uh, going back to blood pressure that we were talking about at the top of the show, Richard is wondering, when is the best time of day to check your blood pressure? Does that matter? Um, uh, the time of day doesn't matter so much as what you were doing immediately before. Here's the scenario that will happen. You go to the doctor's office. You were struggling to get there on time. You were racing through traffic. You had to find a parking spot. You run up the stairs. You go in. They ask you for an insurance card. You couldn't find it. You're frustrated and annoyed. Then they want to take your blood pressure. And of course, it's like way much higher than it would, would have been um, had you had a chance to relax. So in our research studies, we have a rule. Uh, the patient comes in, sit them down, let them sit for at least five minutes in a room that's quiet. Don't read anything. Don't read the stock market. Uh, don't tell jokes. Don't laugh. Don't do anything. Just chill out. And what you will see is if you take their blood pressure every, say, minute or two minutes, it goes down, 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 down. And the blood pressure reading that matters is the one that is, is at the bottom where your blood pressure has stabled out and the stresses of the day are gone. So whether it's daytime, middle of the day, uh, nighttime, what really matters is that you have been quiet beforehand. So with that in mind, a lot of people do it before they get out of bed in the morning. That's fine. Uh, but the key is just be quiet for five, 10 minutes before you, before you take it. Let's take a question from Ram at 1212. Can high blood pressure be reversed or do you have it for good once you have it? Can definitely be improved. Um, absolutely. If you have high blood pressure, do see your doctor. Um, you do want to take it seriously. And if diet and lifestyle don't change it, you need to think about medicines because high blood pressure can kill you. Um, that said, even if you're on medicines, you want to do the diet steps we've talked about. Eliminate animal products. Keep high sodium foods low and high fat foods low because as I said before, um, the fat increases the thickness, the viscosity of the blood. You get that out of there, your blood is thinner. It can flow more easily. You don't need so much blood pressure. Um, and what you'll see is two things. If you make these changes now, it's Wednesday, your blood pressure will start to descend over, within the next couple of weeks, your blood pressure is going to come down. The DASH study showed us that. You could see a decisive drop in blood pressure within 14 days. However, let's say you're losing weight and you lose a little bit of weight this week, the next week, the next week, and maybe over the next six, eight, 12 months, you're continuing to lose weight because of your healthy vegan diet. That weight loss adds to the blood pressure lowering effect over the long run. So absolutely, blood pressure changes. There are some people where it's a little more resistant to change than others, but the vast majority of people will benefit from it. a healthy diet. We have a couple of people right now, Dr. Barnard, in the chat room who are wondering whether a change in their diet can result in having blood pressure that is then too low and what could be done about that. Have you heard of something like that happening? Um, well, it, it depends on who's interpreting too low. Um, if the person taking your blood pressure says, gee, my blood pressure has never been that low. Um, if that person were to follow a healthy vegan diet, their blood pressure would come down too. Um, the, no, the short answer is if you got there through diet, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, you mentioned getting coconut oil out of the diet. Eleanor, 1212, is wondering, what about coconut milk? Look at the fat content um, on the back of the carton and compare it to the almond milk and the rice milk and the others. What you'll typically, and focus especially on saturated fat. If that number is zero, that's my favorite number. So you'll have a, have a look and you'll see. Uh, mommy vegan nummy. Okay. There it is. The fun name, uh, 1212 boy, they're chatty at 1212 today. Uh, wondering whether alcohol can raise blood pressure. Yeah, it can. Um, modest alcohol consumption, modest, you know, a drink every couple of days, no big deal. Uh, when people make it a big part of their life, it can be a problem. Yes. And Zerius125, is it a good idea to cook without any salt to avoid hypertension? So again, we talked about getting it off of the table, but what about the cooking altogether? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I would not add it in cooking. If you're going to add it, add it at the table. By the way, for extra credit, if you add salt at the table, which I think is okay, um, simply because the amount that goes in, you know, it's on the surface of the food, it really becomes very, very, it's, it's very, very small. Um, if you're adding salt, I'm going to say a totally unfashionable thing. 
instead of sea salt, Himalayan salt, kosher salt. Just get some iodized salt. Now, you can get iodized Himalayan salt, but that iodine is good for your thyroid. And salt happens to be one of the very few sources that people kind of reliably access. So that uh, I assume then that would take, uh, you know, like the Himalayan pink sea salt off of the table. Like that wouldn't be a good option because odds are that one has not been iodized. It's not iodized unless it says so on the label. But but they're they're wising up to this because they 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 they're reading the same things that you and I are reading. They realize that a lot of folks are are starting to not get the iodine they need because ordinary salt has been replaced by these non-iodized sources. So it's good to have iodized salt. Let's hop back to uh, talking about giving the immune system a boost. That came up while you were talking about Omicron a moment ago. Again, Mommy Vegan Nummy, uh, 1215 this time, wondering whether there are fruits or vegetables that will make our immune system smart. So are there any that perhaps are more beneficial than others? Researchers have been checking the effects of various foods. Uh, probably the, the, the two biggies that were, were, have been in the headlines a lot are vitamin C, rich foods, you know which, which ones they are, the famous are the citrus fruits. The ones that are more modest and don't want to brag are things like broccoli and other vegetables that do have vitamin C too, but it tends not to be used so much in their marketing and may not be quite as, as vigorous as in some of, say, the citrus fruits. Uh, does vitamin C help against viruses? Probably. Um, the data are all over the place, but for ever since Linus Pauling won his two Nobel Prizes, people have taken vitamin C really seriously. It does seem to help. Uh, regarding coronaviruses, I don't think we've got the data to show that it's applicable there, but generally speaking, it does seem to be useful. Uh, the other big area is um, garlic. And garlic has been shown to have some, uh, what, what appears to be an antiviral effect. What, what I mean is you bring in volunteers, Half of them get placebo, half of them get a garlic extract. And you show that the people getting the garlic have a lot fewer viral colds, for example. I mean, measurably more. Uh, I do think that we have to take this with a grain of salt, too. And that's because some of these studies are, are uh, funded by the people who are making garlic extracts. But the data does seem to favor that, too. Uh, anecdotal here, but worth mentioning nonetheless from Randy Carroll, no relation. Uh, Randy writes in the chat, I caught COVID while with my daughter and son-in-law. She says, I'm totally plant-based while my daughter is mostly, but my son-in-law is not. She says, I fared much better than both and I'm 30 years older. So that kind of goes back to what it was we were talking about with the Sibley study and everything you were talking about as far as how a diet can help with those comorbidities that lowers the risk of having one of those severe COVID infections. You know, Chuck, I'm really glad that you shared that comment because so many people have the idea that we'll never be as healthy as our, our children. Um, you've got, uh, let's say you're 50 and you've got kids who are 20, 25 and so forth, and they're strong and vigorous and so forth. But what you discover is that the idea that 50s and 60s were, that meant you were old. A lot of that really just meant that you had been kind of beaten up by your diet and lifestyle more than somebody younger had been. And so when people are on a healthy plant-based diet, you're not going to live forever, but you should be vigorous and strong in your 50s and your 60s and beyond. Um, this is not the end of life. And if you're feeling sluggish, if you've gained some unwanted weight and so forth, it's not the calendar that did that. It's the foods. And when you change to a healthier diet, uh, yes, you can, uh, you can be as healthy and vigorous as your kids. Would you believe that a couple of weeks ago when I was in Vancouver speaking at the Planted Expo, a woman came up to me. She said, uh, and she was, by the way, in her late 70s, early 80s. She said, I went vegan after seeing a video, Dr. Barnard, that you and I had done, one of these Q&As. Mm -hmm. And she said she has never felt better in her life. She feels like she regained her health and she was just gushing. And I was just blown away that here is somebody's grandmother who is literally outrunning her grandchildren at this point and feeling fit as a fiddle. So it goes to show, just as you said, it is never too late to improve your health. Exactly right. 
Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead now and uh, switch gears. I want to take a follow-up question to a conversation that I was having with Dr. Vanita Rahman last week. Uh, the title of that show is What Happens When We Stuff Ourselves Silly? Uh, so, sp <laughs> so Sparkly here wrote in wanting to know how does stuffing yourself silly affect the heart? We're talking about heart attacks. Does it overtax other organs like the pancreas or the liver? So what are the dangers of gorging? Yes, it sounds like last week must have been Thanksgiving, doesn't it? <laughs> Indeed it was. <laughs> uh, yes, gorging yourself, don't do this at home. Don't do this anywhere. Um, if you're wondering if it's bad for you, yes, it certainly is. The, the obvious thing is that we see it on the scale, of course. You're e gorging means you're eating more than your body really wanted. And so you're forcing it in. Um, and you will gain weight. And this is the time of year when people do it. Uh, the days are getting shorter. It's darker. It's colder. So our inner squirrel comes out and says, winter's coming. I better bury a bunch of nuts and stuff my cheeks and, and eat as much as I can to get ready for winter. And, and uh, we do. And it's not just the parties. We seek out food this time of year. And your average American gains a pound or two this time of year. Don't do that. Um, but it's not just your weight. Uh, when, when those maladjusted people who gavage ducks and geese to, to make foie gras. Foie gras means fatty liver, and it means it's a diseased liver. And what they're doing is they're overfeeding birds intentionally. Now, don't ask me what kind of sadistic person would do such a thing or who would order it on the menu, but it does cause liver disease. Uh, it's, it causes fatty liver because you've got way too many calories than you can expend. Your liver gets fatty. It doesn't stop with the, litter, uh, with the liver. You'll see uh, fat building up around the heart and around other organs. Um, and it will do you damage. So um, eating the amount that you need, leaving it at that, that's, that's what your body's really hoping that you'll do. Uh, Follow-up question to the fats that we were talking about in the diet. Terry at 1222 saying, when you say fats, Dr. Barnard, does that include things like avocado and nuts? Well, avocados, nuts, these are natural foods, and they they, they are very different from the other plant foods and that they are naturally pretty high in fat. Um, and so the question is, is it a problem? The type of fat in avocados and most nuts is, is certainly better than chicken fat, than beef fat, better because it's lower in the saturated fat part that will raise cholesterol and is probably linked to Alzheimer's disease. However, keep in mind what nature did. Nature made nuts and did not put them in little plastic packs and put them on the rack at the 7-Eleven for you to tear open and binge on. Nature actually packed each nut individually in a shell that takes a lot of time to open up. And so given what nature had in mind, you're really not gonna eat huge numbers of them. So where we run into trouble is having these be sort of a whole food group when, when uh, that, that really wasn't something that nature intended. Where I really think it matters, uh, if a person wants to lose weight, getting away from nuts and guacamole is a really good idea. Um, we've talked about uh, improving diabetes. The key to diabetes is getting the fat out of your cells. That means getting it out of the diet too. Uh, for women with hormonal issues, uh, menstrual pain, uh, menopausal symptoms, their getting away from fat seems to help for reasons that are not entirely clear. So yeah, I would be cautious about these fatty foods. And uh, let's take a question here from Nicole. You mentioned viscosity, and as long as we're talking about nuts, uh, Nicole is wondering, for trivia bonus points, can nuts increase blood viscosity? Yeah, they can. Um, your, your, um, your blood is, is based in water, and your blood cells, your red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and things are all in this watery mix. And so what if I have a really fatty food? Uh, some of that fat ends up in your bloodstream and it ends up there pretty fast. And so imagine if you're sort of uh, whisking grease into a, a soup or something that's that's based on water. Will it get thicker? Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, yeah. So any fatty food will do that. Uh, let's take a boy. We got a lot still on uh, high blood pressure today. Uh, Emily at 1223. Can high blood pressure be a genetic trait along with high cholesterol? Yes, it can. Um, uh, there are people who ha who have high blood pressure. They get they inherited it. Um, in the past, it, it was sort of dismissed as being 100% genetic, and nothing you can do will change it. Uh, you don't really know that until you try. So take two, three months, 
be totally vegan during this time, no animal products. If you do that, you'll be avoiding the fat that's in the animal products and whatever sodium they contributed. Keep oils low and then check how your blood pressure is doing. If it has absolutely not budged, then you can blame the genes. But for most people, it'll start coming down. I want to take a very important question here from Kama at 1223, writes, uh, they've lost 35 pounds and saw a significant blood pressure drop after adopting a whole food plant-based diet. But Dr. Barnard, Kama also says that uh, they're trying to wean off of medication because they're getting dizzy spells. How quickly mm. can they wean off of that medication? Oh my goodness sakes. I'm so glad that you raised that question. The, here's what will happen. You're on a vegan diet and you think this is a good thing. And you're, you, you've been vegan for six weeks and you're sitting at the table reading a vegan cookbook. You found the best recipes. You leap to your feet to go to the store to get the ingredients. And just as you <laughs> leap out of your chair, the, bill, the, the room starts going dark because your, your blood pressure is dropping really fast. Here's what happened. You're taking medicines for your blood pressure. You're still on those medicines for your blood pressure. They're really powerful. And the diet that you're on is as strong as a medicine too. So the combination has lowered your blood pressure too much and now you're getting woozy. So the answer is A, let your doctor know that you're making a diet change. The doctor will start backing you off your medications. And B, if this happened to you now, absolutely call your doctor. D don't throw your medicines away on your own, but talk with your doctor and what your doctor is gonna do is to reduce the doses or even just eliminate those medicines. And so many people who are on two or three medicines for their blood pressure, can either reduce them or get off them completely with a diet change. Um, let's talk more about weight loss here. We have a few people in the chat room who are concerned that maybe they're a little bit underweight right now. They don't want to return to eating those high fat, high, heavily processed foods that we were talking about avoiding a little bit earlier, Dr. Barnard. So what advice could you give to somebody who feels like maybe they've lost too much weight, they need to put just a few pounds back on, but they want to do it in a healthy way? Okay, great question. First of all, let's, let's think is your weight a healthy weight or not? Um, because today in, in 2021, um, other people might say you're kind of thin, but that's in comparison to the overall population of whom 60% are overweight. So just because you're thin doesn't mean you're not healthy. You might be the healthiest one around and it may just be by comparison. You're thin. But here's a way to tell, go online, and look up a BMI calculator, that's body mass index. You'll see them on the web, BMI calculator. Plug in your weight, plug in your height. And if it's above 18 and a half, that means you are not underweight. If it's below 25, that means you're not overweight. So you wanna be between 18 and a half and 25. Um, where do those numbers come from? Um, that's the range where you don't see body weight contributing to health issues overall. Now, the truth I think is that the healthiest people are in kind of the lower end of that window, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22. When your weight is getting above that towards 24, 25, you start seeing the health problems maybe starting to, to think about coming in. So if you're above 18 and a half, you're not underweight. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, if you want to increase your weight, you can do it. The healthiest way to do it is to simply make sure you're eating enough. Eating plenty of healthy foods. Secondly, make sure you're exercising. Exercise preserves your muscle mass, builds your muscle mass. It puts the weight where you want it to be. And the third strategy is that people have discovered that if they eat more oily foods, they gain weight, um, which we've been trying to avoid. Um, be careful if that's the strategy you use, because what will often happen is that you will gain weight from eating fatty foods but it'll be all around your waistline and not in some place where you might want it. Is there a, a target amount of fat we should be getting in our diet every day? What is the RDA? We have a few people wondering that right now. Yeah, um, the, 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 the true physiological need for fat is tiny. Uh, just a couple of percentage of your calories is really all the fat that your body physiologically requires. The rest is there just for entertainment. So if you are avoiding animal fats completely, animal products, and if you're cooking beans and grains and vegetables and fruits in unlimited quantities, but you're not adding fat to them, 
the fat percentage that you're going to end up with is going to be, oh, maybe around eight or 10% fat as a, as a percentage of your calories. That's way below where Americans are because fat is added to um, the vegan pizza that you got at the store, um, uh, prepared foods and that kind of stuff and restaurant foods. Um, so your average American is more than 30% of their calories are from fat. Getting that down to around 10 is fine, but you don't need to count. You just eat healthy plant-based foods and use non-oil cooking methods. Be careful about the nuts and seeds and guac and nature will take care of itself. A uh, quick one. Tofu Tuesday says uh, she just took her blood pressure 105 over 60. Gives the old thumbs up emoji. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good on you. Great. Uh, you, 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 this is good blood pressure. You could probably sell that on eBay. No doubt. No doubt about it. Uh, two more quick ones. First one from Maria. Can a lack of sleep increase blood pressure? Uh, if you, if just the lack of sleep alone, no. But what does the lack of sleep do? If you wake up and you had a really groggy night, first of all, your stress level is going to be high in the course of the day. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're not yourself. That, that will raise your blood pressure a little bit. And if it leads you to dietary indiscretions, I got to eat, I'm going to eat anything just to get through the day because I slept terrible yesterday, then that in turn will affect your blood pressure too. All right. And the final question, Ricardo has been uh, wondering this one for a couple of weeks. This is a holdover. Uh, so when I say that we, if we don't get to your question, we'll do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming show. I mean it. This is from last week. Uh, Ricardo wondering, uh, how, uh, how much flax or chia seeds do I have to have uh, to eat, I should say, in order to replace an omega-3 supplement? Oh, wow. Okay. This is for extra credit. Um, yeah. First of all, flax and the omega-3 supplement might be two different things a little bit. Flax oil uh, or flax seeds and flax oil, they have ALA, alpha linolenic acid. That, um, if you want the technical explanation, that's a molecule that has 18 carbons and ALA, alpha linolenic acid. It's in flax. It's in chia. It's in a lot of plant foods, but it's, it's concentrated in those. But if I go to the store and I get an omega-3 supplement, it is more likely going to be the 20 carbon and 22 carbon than the longer ones. So the, what, the, what they'll say on the label is EPA and DHA, and that's what they want to sell you. So um, the amount that you're going to see in a typical EPA DHA supplement might be about a half of a, a gram, uh, something like that. Um, if you take, uh, say, a tablespoon of flaxseed, it'll be a good gram and a half. Um, of, of ALA, but it's a slightly different form that your body then has to elongate. So flax is okay. Um, it, none of this really solves the big controversy though, which is does adding, uh, adding omega-3s really work? And we really don't know the answer to it. The things that people are factoring in, if people have really low levels of omega-3s in their blood, it looks like they might be at a higher risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. However, when people supplement with either things like flax or supplements, we don't yet have any evidence that that really uh, helps prevent Alzheimer's disease, although, although it will change your blood tests pretty quickly. You can see your omega-3 levels go up. But the other issue is that studies started to show that men who supplement with omega-3s, um, are and people who run high levels of omega-3, they got a substantially higher risk of prostate cancer. And when this first came up, we had no idea what to make of it. We still don't. And we thought it was a mistake. But it came up in study after study after study. So now we believe it. Um, and it has made us cautious about recommending pushing omega-3 too hard uh, for men. And if it can increase the risk of prostate cancer in men, could it do something for women? Answer is, we don't know. We're going to be smarter in a couple of years, but that's where we are right now. So what it means is, have healthy plant-based foods in your diet. We don't know if it's a good or a bad idea to be recommending omega-3 supplementation yet. If you do it, go easy. And I would suggest before jumping into a heavy supplementation program, you can get tested. Companies like Omega Quant will send a little card. You put a little drop of blood on it, send it in. They'll tell you if you're low. And then if you supplement, you'll see that it'll change. But um, be careful. 
Dr. Barnard, we have covered a lot of ground today. And the thing that I love about this show is that it does introduce people to the idea of eating a healthier diet, perhaps for the very first time. And that can seem like a daunting task. Like I'm never going to be able to eat the foods that I've been enjoying my entire life ever again, and I'll only be able to eat salads. But that is not the case, as you well know, Dr. Barnard, because as has been accurately pointed out, in the chat room right now, there is a recipe for a black bean brownie that will blow you away on our website, pcrm.org slash recipes. Go there. If you got a sweet tooth and you're worried you're never going to be able to indulge in a treat again, if you adopt a whole food plant-based diet, not so. pcrm.org slash recipes. Go there, try the brownie. Let's talk about that next week and how good that brownie actually is. Have you tried that one, Dr. Barnard? It is mind-numbingly good. It is every bit as good as advertised. Absolutely. Absolutely. This show hopefully also is good as advertised. So if you feel like you raised your health IQ by a point or two, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel on YouTube so that we can raise even more health IQs around the world. And Dr. Barnard, also before we go today, my friend, I also want to say a huge thank you to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund because their support of the exam room live and the physicians committee is making today's episode possible. And the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like ours that carry on Greg's love for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse. Very, very important. So if you would like to learn more about the great work that they're doing, check out their website right now. It's GregoryRyderFund.org. That's Gregory Ryder, R-E-I. T-E-R fund.org. While you're there, you can sign up for their newsletter, check out everything that they're currently working on. And again, we cannot thank them enough for their continued support of the exam room and the exam room live. Allison Mahoney, you are truly a saint. Thank you so very much for everything. And Dr. Barnard, I know uh, how much she means, not just to this show, but to the physicians committee as a whole. Exactly. And to the, to the cause that we're sharing, we're trying to make this world healthier, more compassionate, more thoughtful. Allison has been at the forefront of that and, and in Greg's memory, it's uh, just it's wonderful to see. So thank you so much for that. Can't think of a better way to wrap up the show than on that note. So Dr. Barnard, want to say thank you to you one more time, my friend, and to the crew behind the scenes making the magic happen as always. Thank you all. And to the exam roomies who are so inquisitive, had so many great questions in the chat today. Thank you so very much for stuffing the doctor's mailbag and we will do it again next week. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, as always, keep it plant-based.